Hi, my name is Carol. My name is Hasna, and we are Current Harmony Connections. Current Harmony Connections is an online community organization that aims to raise awareness to the challenges we currently face in society, helping educate people so they can make a positive impact in their communities. Speaking Volumes is our first panel discussion and interview event, and our topics are Asian empowerment, Muslim empowerment, Black empowerment, woman empowerment, navigating COVID, and mental health. Be sure to subscribe and give a thumbs up to our videos. Please follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram. The links will be in the description box below. We hope you enjoy our panel discussions and interviews. Thank you for coming to the CSC channel and being on our Muslim Empowerment panel. Um, can everyone introduce yourselves and give like a background, a bio of what they do and who they are? Um, so we can start with Reem. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm basically um, a British Syrian architectural designer and I'm based in London and I completed my part two at the University of Westminster just last year. So I'm currently doing um, uh, architectural system job um, with Architecture Doing Place and Gozari NG Architects and I'm part of Palestine Regeneration Team and also just recently co-founded um, Muslim Women in Architecture with Zahra and Tahin. Zara, you can go next. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm a architectural designer. I'm currently based in India. I am Indian. Um, but I grew up in the UAE. I was born and brought up there. And um, I met Reem and Tahin at the University of Westminster while I was doing my undergrad degree. And um, I'm currently researching uh, the concept of empty houses in Kerala, there's a phenomenon, uh, with Junaid Abdul-Jabbar, who's an artist as well. And um, I also co-founded NWA with Reem, so that's currently why we're here. Fuduma, you can go next. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Fuduma. I'm based in Minneapolis, where I moved out here about six months ago. I'm a software engineer who recently quit full-time to start my own initiative, which is focusing on, first, it was based just on misinformation. Now it's grown to internet safety for youth as well. Um, earlier this summer, during Ramadan, I started Remote Iftar, which matched about um, a few hundred people who were spending Ramadan alone uh, with others in their time zone so that they could at least break fast together. Um, and more recently, with the George Floyd um, protests that came out of his murder, um, started, an, I guess you could say, essentially teaching activists how to um, use their funds in a more efficient way. And so um, civic tech and civic engagement has been my ideal. And that's kind of why I left Silicon Valley uh, after Growing up there, I graduated in 2018 with a dual degree in computer science and political science from New York University. So I love both the coasts and now being uh, in the Midwest has been interesting. So great to be with you all. And last, Tahin. Um, so I'm a British uh, Bangladeshi part one architect here in London. Um, I am currently an assistant architect in um, architecture doing place. Uh, I completed my part one and part two at the University of Westminster. That's where I met Reem and Zahra. Um, I'm also uh, one of the co-founders of Muslim Women Architecture. Um, and yeah, that's me. Yeah, very interesting perspectives. Thank you for all being here and giving your point of view for this panel. Um, so we'll start off with the first question. What challenges do you often face as a Muslim? And we can start with Zahra this time. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I don't think, so while I was writing this, I don't think I actually faced any challenges as a Muslim until I went to the UK. Because I was born up, uh, born and brought up in a Muslim majority country, so it was, normal to be Muslim um, and when I moved to the UK it was kind of at the exact time of the Paris attacks the Belgium attacks where ISIS was like at large and 
Uh, so there was a general sort of racist undertone. Everything was uncomfortable going on transport. We were more or less very precautious when we were moving because we didn't know the country as well. And um, the areas that we lived in didn't have a lot of Muslims. The only sort of, um, not easy, but like something that calmed me down was that university had a lot of Muslim, it was a very large Muslim population in our university, our, on our campus especially. So I think, yeah, that's the main, I think, challenge. Um, the other challenges I think that I grew up with was maybe the um, sort of double standard that most Muslim women face while, you know, in a society that's South Asian or Arab, um, you know, um, that you need to have family and you need to keep family and career is not that important. And, but I had, uh, my parents were very um, supportive and they kind of grounded me in that sense. So I think, I don't, I wouldn't call it a challenge, but it was definitely sort of a discomfort, like discouragement from other people around me that weren't my parents or cousins or really close friends or family, you know? So yeah, I think that would be challenges. What about you, Fadumo? Let's see, I think, so I'm 24 now, but I remember 9-11 only because we were supposed to move back to Canada that day and our plane got turned around and landed and we were just like, wait, what happened? Um, at that point, growing up, my parents never, um, like I went to Islamic school from fifth to eighth grade, which is from like 10 years old to right before high school, 14. And that was the first time I was able to meet other Muslims. Before then, I went to public schools and we were the only Muslim family and uh, definitely the on only like African Muslim, Black Muslim family in our area, in the Bay Area. So it was interesting because not until I went to high school and that's around 14 is when I started to wear the hijab, did I get discrimination, not from necessarily white people, but people that were multicultural, just of other religions. And so that was interesting to me because I'm like, I thought we were all in this together. <laughs> um, and, and that exposed me to the layers of racism and what that means. And so I kind of had two identities separate. Like I could be seen as a stereotypical black woman or a stereotypical Muslim woman. And it wasn't until I went to university and met other black Muslims or black Muslim women that I was like, no, like these are all our identities and um, they blend together when people discriminate against us. So um, it wasn't until like I really got into STEM that it really affected me as a woman uh, to be the only girl in my classes or things like that. And so that came first and then the black layer, then the Muslim layer. And so from then on, I think right now, uh, like I said, with the, protests in Minneapolis it's been really awesome to see not only Muslims like leading with the fundraising efforts and the cleanup efforts and also the protesting efforts because that's needed but Muslim women too like they're out on the streets like maybe their parents are like okay it's unsafe etc um, but they still did it and then the moms came out and the grandmas also too like there are photos you can see on the Star Tribune of like these Somali grandmas with their long hijabs like protesting and uh, with their masks on and everything um, and that was really beautiful to see that these I, I guess exactly what Zahra was saying these assumptions of we need to put family first stay in the house and not like have our voices heard um, is being broken but even on a generational level here so that's I guess the uh, upside to the discrimination? I mean, there's definitely a lot of assumption that Muslims can only be brown people. I mean, they don't really look at that it can be any race, anyone. They only look at the majority of what they see on the news. So it's often, you know, ignorance. And that's why we're having this panel today to educate. So thank you for being here, Fadumo. Um, Tahin, you can go next. Okay, so some of the challenges I face as a Muslim here in London um, ranges from like, like racial slur, which is, I think, an, um, a generic one that everyone would say, 
but also um, having to rectify um, people's, well, non-Muslims' um, preconceived perception of what a Muslim woman can do and also their preconceived um, perception of what Islam allows us to do. So the fact that I pursued a career in architecture, a lot of non-Muslims like, oh, does your religion allow you to do that? And like that, um, I'm 27 and I'm, you know, I haven't settled down. I haven't, you know, uh, decided to start a family of my own and get married. A lot of non-Muslims go for me, are you allowed to do that? Does your religion allow that for you? And so um, one of the challenges is to, um, like having to rectify this, but then also do it in a, in a way that doesn't um, come across badly because I, I'm, I'm still learning a lot about my religion as well. I'm growing. Um, and so it, there's a challenge where um, I need to um, not sound ignorant, ignorant, ignorant. No, ig my goodness. Um, ignorant, that's the word. Oh my goodness. Can you get this out, please? <laughs> it's okay. Ignorant, darling. Ignorant. God, uh, I always do this to myself. Anyway, so not not sounding ignorant, um, when I tell people um, what Islam, you know, tells us or what the teaching tells us. So that that's a challenge in its own. Um, yeah, so that's one the main two um, challenges that I face being Muslim here in, in London and being a professional woman as well, yeah. Yeah, people often directly relate Islam with women being oppressed. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of hard to get out of that box that you, they put you inside because it's a stereotype that people often put towards you. Um, but there's more like Muslims in the community, especially female Muslims who are becoming successful by the day. And mm -hmm. I feel that, you know, definitely as time passes, it will be seen differently. I, I completely, completely agree. Um, because uh, a lot of uh, Muslim women that are, have decided to um, pursue a career in whatever field, um, they, I feel like they're underrepresented and, you know, women, uh, Muslim women in architecture uh, are so under, underrepresented that we decided to start up M M MWA because, um, yeah, we, all, all, you know, only Muslim women that you would care about that did so well in her field um, in architecture is our Hadid and there's so many more though and so that was the main reason, one of the main reasons why we started MWA um, because there's so many women in the field of architecture that have, are doing amazing work um, and yeah, so it, it's it's good that more and more of these communities are um, starting up, especially in recent in recent years. So it's really good. Yeah, definitely. So Reem, what about you? Uh, so as everyone's already said, the generic one would be the racial slurs, which I'm not actually. To be honest, I haven't had too many of, but like when I have them, it's it's kind of disturbing to be honest yeah. um another thing that i want to bring up is something that we've discussed previously during our muslim women in architecture um kind of um discussion forums that we've had previously which is um definitely a big one and that is like not feeling safe in my own city so um uh, and there's lots of factors that I could put under that. So like being a Muslim woman, kind of like um, you can't really be out at night for re like past a certain time because this, it's just unsafe. And um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of one of them. And, and if I ever wa was to cross that line, I would uh, come across the craziest things on the street and uh, that reminded me why I shouldn't be actually out at that time so I didn't have the freedom in, I don't have the freedom in my city as much as um, a, a norm a kind of a British white British Londoner would have um, so yeah I think that's kind of the the main one um, yeah <laughs> I'd like to piggyback on what Reen said and say that it's like a double-edged sword and we've spoken about this before amongst the three of us um, and several others that you know we go out it, when we go out in London there are certain streets that are 
safe are not safe as women and then there are certain streets that aren't safe as muslim so really when you walk out of the house you're not safe anywhere um you, like if the more desi muslim areas are where you get catcalled and the more white centric areas are where you get racially harassed so you lose <laughs> either way <laughs> I mean, hopefully. I would say the cat calling one is a big one. I would say, actually, yeah. if I was to add it on. The mashallahs. Yeah, like that is a big one. I know, like, I know this is kind of like uh, to a slightly different audience, but if, if you're listening out there, Muslim man, don't do it. It's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, even if, you're, even if you're calling out Allah's name, it's not okay. <laughs> I mean, that's actually the first I've heard of that. So, I mean, thank you for bringing that because, I mean, you know, I'm a recent high school grad, so I, what do I really know, you know? Oh my gosh. But <laughs> <I'm from laughs> the fact you had to go through yeah. that stuff, I mean, that's, um, that's very shocking. <laughs> and when, like, just the comment about New York City is that those that aren't Muslim, um, but are probably like black Americans will see you and just like look away. Like as soon as they see the hijab, like look down, like if it looks like someone else is approaching you, they'll be like, leave the sister alone. Like, so it's wow. really interesting looking into the black history I... of the country because I'm Somali. So I'm not connected to that history of Malcolm X and et cetera, but it's really interesting to see how that switches and then they'll cat call the next woman so it's like what like so like <laughs> it's like yeah it's really interesting these dynamics like yesterday me and tahin got our cat call as we were leaving office from a guy driving past in his car he's like mashallah sister i was like thank you <laughs> that's wild. um i had someone say mashallah in my ear and he was walking with his son my goodness. And like his son was like six, maybe four or five. I don't know. Um, he like I was on Edgware Road. Uh, shout out. Uh, <laughs> uh, walking by. It was daytime. I was there for bank business. If anybody's talking about my whereabouts. Um, yeah. And the guy came up to me side by. Mashallah, sister. And walked. I was like, you're too close, man. Like, thanks for the compliment. Yeah, it's thanks for the spray legal like in London. Five meters away. <laughs> Don't teach them young. I mean, yeah, because yeah, it that's, is, it, that's really it, crazy it, considering, like, <laughs> I mean, in Islam, you like consider everyone your like, brother, your sister, and things like that. But I mean, there's different types of people in Islam, like, you know, like in every religion, good, bad, weird. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think we'll move on to the next question. Um, so what is one of the significant barriers that you've had to overcome? And we can go with Faduma this time. Hmm. I think it was, the first one was um, moving uh, to college because the best uh, deal I got through scholarships and stuff like that was that I had to move um, to the other side of the country from my family. And they of course had, uh, their encouragements, but also exactly what we've been discussing when the community has a say in like what you do and what, what you're up to, it like kind of affects them as well. And so when I eventually moved, like did the whole deal, like made sure I had a Muslim roommate um, in the dorm, uh, made sure that I like got in the MSA right away, all the good stuff while um, their kiddos were doing God knows what, like, right like in their home or like right outside so it's like come on auntie like you, you you don't even know what muhammad is up to or whoever it is like and you're like saying something about me so i think that was the most challenging thing because it was paired with being homesick but trying to remain like strong like outwardly so that my parents didn't worry but also knowing they were worrying because of just gossip and then i moved back after those four years and who knows what all those kids that were saying something or their parents are up to. And so I think that was the first main one. Uh, and then the second was really just ongoing. It's just being a woman in programming, like people just have assumptions about 
okay, did you get a BS degree or BA degree? Like, did you really study this? Like giving you questions they wouldn't give to someone else. Um, and it's just constantly trying to prove yourself no matter how much you accomplish. And at first, um, that was like really exciting for me because it's like, you don't even know, like I'm going to prove you wrong. But now it's more of a tiring thing where it's like, okay, I've been through this uh, for a while. And so um, now as uh, Tahin was mentioning, like, it's like, oh, like now that you've done this, like when are you going to start a family? And like, that that's the big next step versus like, I got all of this work done. Like, can I just take a break real quick? And so yeah. it's not coming from family. It's what comes from the community. And that's been the challenge. Yeah, I mean, definitely like my parents, I mean, I'm only 17. So not really receiving that comment from my parents. If anything, they don't even want to bring that up until later. Um, but I do get like, you know, outside comments from like relatives. So when do you want to get married? One time somebody asked me when I was like 14, when do you want to, so what age do you want to get married? And I kind of just looked at her like, really? <laughs> like, you're going to ask me at this age? I mean, is that even proper for you to ask me? But mm. yeah, I mean, it's... Girl, that's late. <laughs> 17 is late. I mean, it's it's when our, in our family, people started talking about marriage while I was 12. Really? Yeah, because I looked, I looked older. Um, as soon as I hit puberty, people started talking about, I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't legit. It wasn't like a thing where, you know, you have to get married tomorrow. But it was sort of like a conversation to prepare you to be married. Like, it's coming. It's going to happen. This is your priority. This is something that you need to consider every step of the way when you get educated where you work where you get educated um you know like what your priorities are going to be in the future it's kind of like priming you to be that person which it it doesn't exist for men um, in the same capacity that happens only when they're 25 and the aunties are like oh all the good girls are going to go away you need to start getting married you know, uh, we face that from, I don't know. Yeah, like I said, 12 for me anyway. I mean, I feel like as soon as you get older, they'll think that like nobody wants to marry you. So they're trying to like, you know, marry you off quickly. I mean, not like yeah, really. It's, yeah, don't get me wrong. It's not marry you off quickly. So like, I'd like to clarify and say that it's not that they're trying to marry you early. Yeah. Um, it's trying to kind of say, this is the future, so you have to consider it from before. There's no way you're mature enough to get married now, but we're prepping you to be mature enough to be married at whatever age is acceptable after your education. Um, and I'm just saying that the difference is that it doesn't exist for Muslim men as much as it does for Muslim women. Um, so like I'm 25 and I'm not married. I'm turning 25, but <laughs> clarification. Um, and I mean, like Tahin said, she's 27. You know, there's there's several people that haven't gotten married, uh, like they're 40 and it is it is a big deal, but it's not something that our religion has. Like, it's not like you have to get married when you're a certain age. There's no such thing. Um, it's just a cultural practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, a cultural practice that you know, many of us like have, it's certainly not, you know, a requirement and people often mistake that as a requirement. They think that, you know, Muslim women need to get married early rather than try to stabilize their career first. Mm -hmm. I mean, when that woman had asked me that question, like when, what age do you want to get married? Or one time I went to a wedding and one even asked you, would you like to get married in like five years? And I just looked at her, I was like, um, I want to focus on my studies right now. I mean, I mean, like I plan to study for like eight years, so that would take up a lot of time, but I kind of want to stabilize myself and, you know, be able to live for myself first before you yeah. try to take care of a family. I think also like, um, obviously islamically you know the man is the provider of the household so they think oh you know just as long as you've got that it doesn't matter why do you have to provide for yourself like you don't have to provide for yourself so don't even don't even like go through the stress of 
trying to secure your um, education that much because it's not really going to be beneficial, but that's actually wrong because uh, what you're doing is you're making women um, basically um, have to rely on someone else rather than themselves. And then what happens if they're put into a situation where uh, their husbands die, for example, in the future and they find themselves that they're left alone and they actually need to provide for themselves. And yeah, it's kind of a, a very dangerous practice that um, communities have. Um, yeah, definitely. Muslim women and their husbands should stand side by side when it comes to earning for the house and providing, taking care of everything. I mean, just looking at my parents, that's how it's been since they've been in America. They both work, they both stand side by side um, and they work together. Um, but then I have a lot of family members where the men work and then the wives, they stay home. So it's certainly different perspectives, but yeah. Um, so Tahin will go back to the original question since we've deviated a little bit from it. So the question was, what is one of the significant barriers that you've had to overcome? Um, okay, so one of the significant um, barriers that I had to overcome um, was, oh gosh, uh, my, so my family, uh, like, so my parents have been amazingly supportive with me chasing my career. And so, um, you know, they supported me throughout my teens and even to my 20s, they were like, yes, you know, you want to do undergrad, do an undergrad, you want to do a um, master's, do a master's. And I still have um, a diploma left to do before I'm chartered. And they're like, yes, do it. And, um, you know, talk about getting married and settling down. Obviously, they are bringing it up a bit more because, you know, I'm in my late 20s. So, understandable but with extended family I had this you know these conversations coming up early in my teens and so going back to what you know we were talking about you know having these um they see aunties coming to you it's like oh so Tahin so when do you want to get married and people did come and it's like oh why don't you get your um, daughter married off like you know um you know when she's 18 or whatever and I lived in Bangladesh for a period of um time so for three years uh during my middle of my teens I lived in Bangladesh and so it was even more so you know she's a foreign you know girl um you know she's got the passport you know we've got all these guys for you <laughs> um and yeah so that's all that matters and you know she's she's young um and she won't be too um independent it'll be easy to control her and so there was a lot of like aunties coming up with all these potentials and my parents were Kept, they kept saying no, no. She, I want, I we want her to get an education, be independent, um, you know, be able to provide for herself. And um, yeah, so that that wasn't a barrier that I had to come with my parents. It was a barrier that I had to come uh, overcome with the community that I was in. Um, and there there was one time in particular that I can never forget. It was this person that I I don't even know. It was so it was this random guy. My mom and I when um to uh, this uh, plant nursery and uh, we were buying some plants and the owner of um, the store he was just kind of talking to us about you know just casually talking to us whilst we were picking out plants and the guy could tell that I was you know not from Bangladesh originally um, and you know they he could tell that um, we're foreign and so he was saying oh, so what, what school have you Put her in and everything and my mom's like oh, I put her in a private school in an uh, English school um, and the guy was like oh you shouldn't be spending that much money on um, you know giving her a good education well no he didn't say in those words you, you shouldn't be spending too much money you know you should have just put her in a bangla medium school so a bangla spoken school which is cheaper and it's like a state school um, because you know in a few years she'll get married off and so you don't you don't need to um, waste that much money and I, and I was so offended it's like my parents has chosen to give me an, a good education for me to be independent and who are you to be making such comments like this and I just thought it was so disrespectful and he was talking completely in Bangla and he thought I wouldn't understand because you know um, I, I grew up here in the UK, I don't know how to speak the language, and so he's having this conversation with my mum, and I was so offended, and I, I'll never forget it, and it just made me realise that we live in a society where, you know, um, everyone, well, 
not just the Bangladeshi um, community and the society is that you have in other cultures as well that they think that oh you know women don't need to get a good education they don't need to chase a career because all that they um, need to do is be able to cook and clean and stay at home and be good with the kids and that's enough for them really and uh, that's you know that's their life and and so having to break that boundary with um, um, with the community that I'm in um, was challenging and I still feel like I'm having to do that now because I'm 27, 20, 28 um, this year and um, I'm comfortable with the fact that I'm chasing my career and obviously yes I do have um, the the thought of um, you know getting married and I do want that obviously for myself but for me um, it's you know it will happen organically when it's the time is right it will happen it's written if it's written for me it will happen so I want to focus on myself and my career um, and again my family like my parents are amazingly supportive so if it wasn't for them I wouldn't have it wouldn't have been so easy for me and I understand that a lot of girls they they're not fortunate like that so a lot of girls their their mom and dad are the ones that are forcing them to get married and I think that is really <sighs> I don't know what, what what I don't know what to say. It's really um, unfair for them because um, they should be given an opportunity to become independent um, and chase a career if they do, if they choose to. Not everyone wants to, so you know I respect that. Not everyone wants to choose a career and become you know you know career driven or whatever it is. Uh, some people just want to have a family and that's enough for them. Um, but yeah, I think that also was a barrier uh, like a barrier that I had to overcome to accept that some women want to be at, stay at home mom and all that and I, and I know this is like a very um unconventional like not very feminist view um but in, in the beginning I didn't understand like stay at home moms and all that but now I, I respect that and I get that because you know if you want to do that that you know I respect that as a woman but if you want to chase a career and if you want to become independent and you should be allowed to do that your family should be the one supporting you you know forget what the community is telling you if your family can be support can be supportive they should be supportive then definitely go for it i'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm i'm rambling off now um I, i'm not sure if i'm making sense but yeah that's what i had to say i had a lot to say sorry no it's okay it's okay i mean it's certainly frustrating so it's good to get it all out now yeah <laughs> especially to correct the, the like the stereotypes that people have put against us um yeah. so, uh, can, yeah. I, can i just comment like i think it's just that we um when we talk about feminism we kind of look into the western ideal so even with like stay at home moms, whether or not they have a career, whether they're interested in a career, it, it seems like something that isn't feminist. Um, but if it's their choice and it's something that they're doing on their own accord while discussing with their families, all that stuff, that's still just as feminist as, yeah. you know, a person I, that decides not to get married up yeah. until their sixties or until they're dead. It doesn't matter. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's, it's sense of agency yeah um so that's something i just I, I had I, I struggled to accept i'm not gonna lie that was a barrier same 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 come to like respect that there's some women that choose to do that but yeah. again you know to be able to have the choice to do that that and it's their personal choice that is a form of you know empowerment as well like you know that you chose to be a stay-at-home mom and i respect that as a woman but if it's forced upon them you know there is a fact like from them to stay at home and not chase a career and all that uh, for me that's unacceptable and I feel like um, you know do whatever you can to break that boundary or overcome that boundary because then needs if you if you know if that's something you want to do then go for it you know yeah Sorry, just dropped a link about intersectional feminism because that's what I always respond with when people approach with that kind of assumption before they actually get to know uh, the different approaches. Like if you're really a feminist, that means you understand different perspectives and different backgrounds. So Kimberly Crenshaw, um, I think she has a few 
writings on this, but this is just a quick video on it. So if you ever want to send it to Thank anybody. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, definitely we should all take a look at it. I mean, once that panel is over. Um, Zara, did you get to answer the question? Uh, when you commented, was that really your answer or do you have another answer for like, what is one of your Oh no, I have another answer. Um, yeah. uh, what was, so it was about bound barriers, right? On a significant barriers that you've had to overcome. Um, so, I mean, okay. So there was like an incident that happened in in my final year in London. And I mean, that kind of was a significant barrier that I had to overcome. And there was a lot of racism and it like took six months of my mental health out the window kind of, yeah, but I'm not gonna go into detail into that um, because it was a one-off incident and it's not necessarily something that happens uh, often. Um, but I think, I mean, I spoke about this with Reem and Tahin, and I think in general, it's imposter syndrome. It's just, um, I mean, it's not something that I've overcome. It's still something that I struggle with. And it's like obviously been there since high school. And, you know, even with applying to London and whether or not I'll get in, like I got into all the schools that I applied to, but when I was applying, I thought I wouldn't get into any. And that kind of sort of narrative has always existed with me where I'm not confident about myself or I'm kind of sabotaging um, the work that I do. And um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what like how I can overcome it, but I think starting to open up about my feelings and mental health and stress and anxiety, um, that has helped a lot with like opening up conversations with friends, family, um, that has kind of become the first step to recovering that imposter syndrome. So there's like a backup of people that I go to, I'm like, hey, I need validation. Come on now. And then, you know, there's a, there's like a big paragraph, like, hey, you're okay, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And then you're, yeah, you're good. Um, so yeah, maybe I should work on the seeking validation thing. Yeah, maybe that's my barrier that I need to overcome. What about you? Um, hold on, I wrote something down, what did I say? Yes, so, yeah, my, my barriers have been my personal barriers. So like, I, when I started university, for example, um, I always felt that I would look at who the successful people were in my um, class mm -hmm. and I would think, okay, I'll assess and I'll look and I think it seems like they're all from a certain background so I think I can't make it to kind of the successes that they're at because I'm from a different background so um, there was a lot of there was a lot of inner battles with myself to kind of um, snap out of that mentality and and have self-belief in myself um, so yeah, self-belief in myself was one of the biggest um, kind of barriers that I've had to overcome. Uh, just thinking that and believing that if I need, to, if I want to be successful and I want to make it somewhere, I can do it. I just need to work as hard as everyone does. Um, but sometimes I feel like as a Muslim woman, you kind of need to work even harder to prove people like there's a baggage that comes with it um, you're not just kind of trying to be successful in your in in your work or that your studies you're also trying to prove maybe certain people within your community or true or prove to the white man that um you don't have to be white to be successful um you don't have to come from a privileged background for example um to be successful you can be from uh, just a middle class or working class um to make it up there so yeah that was kind of one of the barriers um so let's go to the next question what are some preconceived misconceptions that people have had towards you and how did you deal with it so we can start with tahin um oh gosh i i was uh, ready for the uh, the fourth question sorry i think you missed a question there didn't you or? 
uh, positive how can we positively impact um, impact the media yeah media's portrayal of islam oh no never okay uh, yeah i can let you go ahead and answer that one okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um okay so i i was mentally prepared to answer that and so i um yeah okay so um so what can we put um what can we do to positively impact the media's portrayal of islam um i think uh starting up initiatives like you know um, mwa or there's loads of others like there's black females in architecture there's all these other organizations that are um giving these like muslims um oh sorry black females in architecture is for the black community but you know initiatives like that you know giving a platform an online platform where people um from diverse backgrounds can talk about their experiences um, and opening up a dialogue opening up opening up conversations um about their struggles and um the struggles that they've been through um it's uh, really important and it i feel like it will definitely um well not definitely um i feel like it will have positive some sort of positive impact in some way and if if not for um everyone it will definitely be a positive impact for other muslims so having these kind of um platforms and initiatives um are important for us as a community so as a muslim community we really need this to have this kind of support network it's so important um i was lucky enough to go to a university that had quite a large muslim community in, in in the architecture course not everyone in um the field of architecture was fortunate like that so in my year alone um i had about 10 muslim women i'd say that did architecture and then there was muslim men as well um if in other universities in london it will be one or two um so that's where i met rim in my first year of undergrad um and then a few years later we met zahra um, at the University of Westminster as well. Um, Zahra will tell you that, you know, she didn't um, have that many Muslim um, colleagues in her course. Um, but yeah, so having MWA has really uh, connected a lot of people worldwide, amazingly, um, that, was, that are doing um, architecture. Um, and a lot of people have been telling us, you know, we've been wanting a platform like this for so long um and you know why didn't we think of doing this before um but yeah so i think that is a positive it has been it's having a positive impact um if not the media at least social media and like people's you know, perception of what muslim women are doing um yeah that, that's my answer um what about you Fadumo? i think for me it's been seeing especially Muslim women in media, like actually taking up journalist jobs and um, writing jobs where they can write um, from a certain perspective, because from what I've seen, even positive um, stories centered around either um, care, like filed another lawsuit against discrimination, um, there's a tinge there. Like it's like, it's just that they don't have the language to speak to when asking these questions and so mm -hmm. with remote iftar um it was featured in awesome publications but the first one was good morning america because muna who advocated she she's um she's my age so she's not high up there but she advocated for the story because someone literally said i need ramadan stories like what do y'all got and she's like i got you <laughs> don't ask questions like I'm Muslim, I'm a woman, like I'll, I'll speak to Fadim. Like if it wasn't for her, then other people wouldn't have approached asking very similar questions that she used. So based off of her efforts. And so I hope um, from that people learned, this is why you need diverse voices in the room or else they wouldn't have had a story to put up. And so I think um, encouraging all jobs that aren't necessarily we all have gone through it. it's like you're a doctor lawyer engineer whatever but for muslim communities it's more like you're a doctor like that's it <laughs> or something of that perspective or something in the medical community so i'm so glad that all of us on this panel today are um, looking at different views and perspectives and i'm glad that those voices are rising up um, especially 
with even putting a woman in a hijab on a like front desk when you're putting on the TV in the like daily recap. Um, Noor was uh, one that stood out a few years ago, but there are several in Canada. And it's like no question, but it's usually in larger Muslim communities that it's okay because it's like, mm-hmm. oh, like everyone's used to seeing the hijab now. But I really hope, like, especially um, in places where maybe there are large Muslim communities, but everyone is more segregated. Um, Though, like, people, like, a young kid can see someone that looks like their mom or dad um, in these places because that's kind of where things come from. Like, Black Panther was huge because it was an all-Black cast. And so how about we... Like, I know movies and art portrayal are different um, depending on our upbringing, but it'd be cool to have superheroes that have a Muslim background or something like that. So it's like different perspectives. I mean, they will bring up Miss Marvel. The Miss Marvel movie will be coming out. Oh. um, And she's a Muslim main character. Awesome. Pakistani. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna, I was going to mention that, but I was also going to mention another um, Saudi, uh, I, don't, I actually genuinely don't remember her name, but I have the comic book, and she created a superhero called Hijabi Girl. Oh, wow. And wow. <laughs> so uh, the only Comic Con I went to back in like 2014, <laughs> 13, I can't remember, um, but it was the only thing I picked up, and it was just genuinely Hijabi Girl on the cover talked about how she you know used her hijab to be superhero and like uh, save the world and yeah it was was amazing I mean it wasn't famous but it was still amazing it was it was encouragement for that you know for my age Um, what was the lady called the one who um the American um I think she's an American black hijabi and she fencing she does the fencing and then they came yeah. up with the Barbie, like Barbie version of her. Yep. But it's yep. kind of like, that yep. was like a really big thing in my opinion, because that that's kind of like you're infiltrating the system yep. for <laughs> yeah. your successes and for being good at what you do. Cause she's so good at what she does. I think we have to be good at what we do. And then automatically you're going to kind of like attract that kind of positive energy and I love how you attention. said infiltrating. Yeah, we have to. <laughs> Creeping Sharia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're not here to take over the world, guys. You can chill. Calm down. <laughs> um, yeah, Zara, do you have, like, what's your answer for how could we possibly portray the media? You know, the portrayal? Um, I mean, all the answers are kind of... Um, what I was thinking as well. Um, One of the things that I was going to mention was that media is a very loose term now. Like, I feel like social media and traditional media are kind of on par, almost. Um, People are on their phones, like, several hours a day. And, you know, the more you're on social media, the more you're visible, take space, don't, like, I mean, this is something that we uh, we spoke about um, to specifically Muslim women architects who kind of feel underwhelmed or overwhelmed, sorry, uh, overwhelmed and um, the imposter syndrome kicks in and you kind of worry about your work being there or, you know, not actually um, showing up or taking opportunities because you, you think you won't make it. Um, do it. Do it anyway. Regardless of what people say, just take space. Um, speak out nobody's gonna say anything like even if they do they're probably wrong um (laughs) a lot of people are ignorant uh don't know what they're saying just believe in yourself yeah so i think that's yeah take up space taking up space is really important what about you reem i literally wrote down take up more space (laughs) (laughs) obviously i've written down more things but i said um so I feel like, as everyone else has said just uh, just before me now, um, we need to carry on with the initiatives that we've started, these positive ch- um, changes that we're kind of advocating for, like uh, celebrating Muslim women in architecture. Um, uh, you know, what you guys are doing with the this Muslim empowerment uh, panel, like 
the more we do it, the more positive, uh, the more positivity we're creating. There's so much negativity out there and the media is quick to want to talk about these things. But if we keep going on with the positive positivity that we're bringing to the table as well, um, they'll have no other choice but to reach out to us and want to talk to us about it. Um, like Fuduma was saying as well, you know, they want to have that kind of um, story in their, in their uh, headlines. And okay, fair enough, it kind of makes them look like the good people because they're trying to be inclusive. And we've kind of experienced that at the moment in, in practice, me and Tahin at the office we're at, they want to kind of show that they're including people from BAME backgrounds. Okay, fine. They're kind of trying to give themselves a perfect image, but this is also an opportunity for us to also kind of like uh, as I was saying, take up that kind of space. If it's being offered to us, why not? Um, and um, I think the first time uh, I experienced it myself was through the Muslim Women in Architecture, where we decided that we were going to take part in the London Festival of Architecture. And someone from the Royal Institute of British Architecture Journal contacted us uh, really randomly. It was like uh, I was flicking through and it was really interesting to come across and see that um, this Muslim Women in Architecture uh, business thing that you're talking about, um, not business thing, but you know, the idea mm -hmm. um so tell me more about it she just wanted to know more about it so the more we kind of uh, take up uh, if we take up one opportunity that leads up the doors to kind of uh, further opportunities and your your whatever you do it's gonna it's gonna eventually uh, reach out the bigger media um, and yeah celebrate yourself so if you don't celebrate yourself if you don't talk about yourself, if you don't hype yourself up on your own social media um, platforms, then how do you expect other people to kind of talk about you and, and uh, celebrate, your, celebrate you? So it needs to start from within and have that, if you have your own, if you have that positive outlook on the work that you're doing, people will also, that energy will be reflected and people will feel it and they'll also um, carry that on through, through their platforms as well. Say the dua for Nazar though, because we know that's real. Like evil eye, you know, there's duas for that. You gotta, you gotta do that. We believe in the evil eye. Definitely, definitely, trust me. Yeah, I mean, in order to like positively impact the media's portrayal of Islam, like you said, continue to do these initiatives, start these organizations, have Muslim representation, let's say correct, Muslim representation. I know that there have been some Muslim shows and definitely they do not show the values of what Muslim girls or what Muslim men should do and how they should follow the religion. Um, yeah, and the media often portrays the bad parts, right? So I'm from Afghanistan and the only thing that they portray there is the poor parts are the terrorism. Um, which obviously even Afghan people are going through. We're being terrorized. And I mean, it's something that Faduma said that people don't even realize that Muslim people are the ones that are also being terrorized because of these like extremist groups. Um, and that goes into the next question is that what are some preconceived misconceptions that people have had towards you and how did you deal with it? often these preconceived misconceptions come from the media and how they portray where you're from. Um, and often you have to deal with that, you know, basically because people think that I'm from the desert and that we don't have anything there. Um, they think that we don't have soda over there. They think that I've rode a camel before. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting to share like our experiences. So what would you say, Zahra? Like, uh, the misconceptions that people have had towards you. Okay, so I have like a couple. So one is when I came to London, people assumed that I was very, very, very rich. Like I owned a Ferrari because I'm from Dubai. Like I, I grew up in Dubai. Um, <laughs> but that's not the truth. Like 47% of Dubai is Indian. Um, and I'm Indian. Um, not Dubai, sorry, 47% of the United Arab Emirates is uh, Indian. The second, I think, is because I wear a scarf, people assume that I'm really religious. So I'm like, 
there's no way I'm going to listen to you. You know, I'm always on the bean, so I can't understand your struggles. I'm always going to judge you if you don't wear a job, et cetera. So they don't approach me. And then there's another set of people that comment on how I wear the hijab or maybe I'm not very bean like or I'm not wearing the hijab right or something or the other. Um, and then they don't approach me because that's, again, like a preconceived notion. Um, and then there's the middle ground people like Reem Thahin <laughs> and the rest of us um, who are just, yeah, doing their thing and, you know, like connecting on different levels and um, trying their best to just live life and work hard and not just snooping around everyone else's business, you know. Um, yeah, just live and let live, man. Um, and I, I haven't dealt with them. If that's what you're asking, I just kind of avoid them. You don't want to be in contact with them anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about you, Fajuma? Exactly what Zahra said. It's always one way or the other. People always have something to say. So it took a while, but I finally got to a point where um, whether it's how I'm wearing my hijab, whether it's uh, political views has been the main thing as of late. Um, I'm radical in the sense that I'm like a Bernie voter or something like that. Like, of course, I'm going to end up voting in the November elections, but people, especially after the protests here, um, even my parents included, we're just like, it won't make a difference if you participate. So just don't participate. Like, and it's like, actually it did make a difference. Like other people, exactly what Reem was saying, if you hype it up, other people start to follow suit, but you'll never know unless you start and then get the ball rolling. And so I think preconceived like, con like uh, assumptions have definitely been around voice. So I'm really, really grateful for Twitter right now, even though they have a lot of issues <laughs> because that's how I've been able to connect with awesome Muslim women like you in other places that aren't close to me. And so um, it's been uh, interesting as of late. That's like the most recent one. But of course, the stereotypical, um, what does it mean you're African? Are you black? Are you not black? That's a whole nother debate to get into. Even within the African community, uh, many people don't even consider themselves black um, because that's different. Um, but I'm like, when you get pulled over, you're considered black, like, unless, and then there's another layer of being a Muslim woman with a hijab on, then you're seen as, like, not educated, dainty, like, maybe you won't understand, so people talk to you a little slower, and it's like, no, I got it, come on, and so, um, yeah, there's so many <laughs> different things, but the political one and using your voice has been the most recent one. What about you, Reem? Um, it's really interesting that Fuduma um, mentioned that last point because that's literally how I feel. Um, just recently when I started work, um, so previously I, I've always been surrounded by uh, uh, a diverse kind of team of colleagues or classmates wherever I've been or even tutors. Uh, so recently I started a new job uh, in a place where there's shared um, desk spaces. So um, uh, I've never had so many white colleagues in my life before. So this was the first for me. Um, so equally, just like I had pre uh, misconceptions about them, they would have naturally had misconceptions about me. Um, but the biggest one is, you know, holding certain conversations without them about the religion, like, what does the Quran say about this? Or what does, you know, what is Shia and what's Sin? Like just things like that. You know, it just kind of, it was really interesting to, to, to see that they were uh, kind of open-minded to have these conversations, but equally they were surprised that I was open-minded to have those kind of conversations with them. They, so I just feel like sometimes um, white people or people who aren't from Muslim backgrounds are a bit, um, scared to kind of approach us and have these conversations with us because they see the hijab on our head so they think oh her head's veiled so is her brain veiled as well I mean, I mean like they kind of, you know like they kind of like link it together they think just because I'm I may seem like a, I'm conservative from the outside they think that my um, my approach to certain things are also conservative so if they were to have these kind of conversations with me they think that I might kind of 
um, uh, judge them or say no don't how could you say that about my religion or how could you question it or but yeah I, I feel like that's one of the biggest misconceptions um, but yeah yeah people often think that we're not open-minded or anything exactly that, like we would that we're trying to push our religion onto other people when really mm. we just want to go about our own lives like you do we're not trying to push anything on anyone if you ask us we will tell you if you don't exactly if you if you don't ask then we won't tell you whether we wear the hijab or not um and what about you Tahin? Um, I, I'm just going to go off what Rim says, um, said because uh, Rim and I work in the same practice so um, we share the same um, co-working space so I've got those same white colleagues um, and yeah so it was interesting um, or it still is interesting that uh, I have these conversations with them because um, they naturally think that because I wear the hijab I wouldn't be so open-minded and so they um, in the beginning they didn't feel comfortable um, asking me certain things so one of them would ask me a certain question the other one would give the other a, a look like oh I can't believe you said that how are you asking her that isn't she going to be offended so uh, like they they're trying to be mindful and respectful of the fact that I might not be interested in having these conversations and I respect that but some of us are open-minded. We are happy for you to come and ask us certain things, but don't come to us like completely ignorant. Like do your research, do your reading. And if you have something that you don't understand, we are happy to have those conversations with you and direct you in, a, um, in another route or um, share our experience as, as a Muslim. So there's so much that you can read online and all that, but then it's, it's also different having these conversations with a Muslim and a, like a professional a woman a professional woman as well that's pursuing a career and so having that rapport is so good you don't have that with an article you don't have that with a book and so um i think they genuinely appreciate that we are open-minded and i think not an, i understand not everyone has that mental caliber to have these conversations and i respect that again but um you know and, and so a lot of the muslim that they might have approached in the past they they come off quite close minded or they just kind of stick to what they believe in all that and i get that again you know, not everyone has that mental caliber to have these conversations these open-minded conversations and i respect that but those like you you need to test the water a little bit like you start off with something small and then if they think oh okay you know they seem okay i can have they seem open-minded i can have a co good conversation and then you start adding bits adding bits and you add more big ask more big questions and you can have the really really um amazing conversations and yes you are from different religions from different races um but it's so important to have these conversations because you understand those people you is like you can integrate and uh, like understand and empathize for different communities different religions it's like what's the point of living our separate lives and then um you know being like scared of the other like oh you know the fear of the unknown if you don't know about that religion if i don't know about that race and i don't know about x y and z i will be scared and we have that a lot so islamophobia is literally the fear of islam people don't know what it's about they don't do their research and they're like okay everything that we see on the media that is what islam is you know terrorists explosions you know um rapists so, you know all this x y and z and then they believe everything that they see on on the tv everything they see on the news everything they see on the newspaper and some people um you know they don't go out and do that extra reading and i get it again not everyone has the mental caliber to do that but you know if you have a Muslim um, neighbor, just start off having a casual conversation with them. See what they have to say. Um, you know, London is such a diverse city and it's amazing that we have that, you know. But despite that, some pe people still like to stay within their own little tight communities. And it's such a shame because, it, you know, there's so much to it and just embrace it all. Um, you know, it's not going to... It's not, it's not a bad thing, it's an amazing thing to embrace all the different cultures and just being, like living in harmony with everyone. You know, that's what you want, right? In, in, a, 
um, in a society, in a community where everyone's respectful of one, one another's um, views and beliefs doesn't have to mean that you all share the same belief, just being respectful and living in harmony. Um, yeah, so that, that was, I went off a tangent again, um, but that's uh, the pre um, preconceived misconceptions people have had of me as a Muslim woman and what I've done to overcome it. Yeah, definitely what you said about harmony. I mean, that's what we're all about. That's why Carol and I have created Current Harmony Connections in order to show the different races, religions that are being discriminated against and show that we should all live in harmony because and at the end of the day, we're all similar because we all are human. That's the most important thing. We're all human. We just believe in different things. Um, and that's one of the important things to show, especially with this panel and the other ones that we have. Um, yeah, I just want to add on this, um, like one of the um, one of the conversations that we've had with our uh, white colleague who's agnostic was saying at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't really matter which religion you're from, just as long as you're going by good morals and you're living a good life, that really should matter at the end of the day. So yeah, I just wanted to add on to that as well. Uh, can I play, I don't know if this is playing devil's advocate or not, but or being a little too negative. Um, but we've had conversations about uh, architects' role in political relations and um, how we essentially shape cities and therefore we, we also shape relations uh, between communities. And, you know, for example, in London, there's obviously several um, neighborhoods that aren't necessarily created intentionally, or maybe they are created unintentionally, I don't know, but there's definitely cliques that exist within the city of London, um, you know, where if you go to Edgware Road, mostly Arab, if you go to, I don't know, Nottingham, the, not Nottingham, Notting Hill Gate, it's mostly white, um, you know, South Side, mostly black, like everything is kind of position and you go anywhere if you go to Dubai there's a certain area you go there mostly Punjabi Indian there's a place where you go it's Pakistani um, and I feel like regardless of like living in harmony and being um, respectful of other people's religions and stuff is only possible if we're actually intersecting with each other and intersection with communities only happens if there are actual spaces that exist where they can intersect. If we're going to uh, a school that's in our neighborhood that is primarily or majority the culture that we're from, then it's pointless. Like it only, it only happens if there's actual intersectional communities happening within the city. I mean, this is an architectural perspective, yeah? But I think it works the same way in terms of social media. Um, we only see what we are interested in. That's how the algorithms work. Um, therefore, we're seeing all the political, uh, you know, yeah, Bernie, yeah, um, Jeremy Corbyn, you know, of course they're going to win. And then what? How, how are these people winning? This, this makes no sense. Because there's like a whole other side of the world that hasn't intersected with our communities. Like, how, how do we change that is... I think the important question, like obviously that's through political um, changes, like policy changes. And I think, I mean, I don't know where I'm going with this, but yeah, it seems, it seems like a lot bigger than just, I don't know. I don't know what to like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Does anybody want to jump in and kind of help me out here? Different approaches. Yeah, I think everyone involved, like you said, it's architects, it's politicians. I just dropped a comment saying that politicians, especially the conservative side, um, which I feel like is a global thing, um, have grouped voters together in a way that they can target them more easily. And same with social media, like it people like the politicians here if you ever see them um having a conversation with 
like the head of Microsoft or Facebook or whatever, they don't have the language. So they're just kind of like, why am I getting this ad? And then they'll have a really simple answer for them and then they get away with it. Like it's more than that. Um, and so I think it's having, I don't know what the language to use for in the UK or globally, but having like policy groups that work all together, having all these different players, I guess you could call them at the same table and just hash it out because um, obviously we've seen the swing towards um, a more um, racist and closed-minded approach to the heads of all governments. It's like swinging that way. And it looks like it's a trend that's going to continue because unless you know exactly the intuition you had, Zara, where you know that there are others out there, you're just not connected with them. And so I started an alternative account where I just follow these exact media accounts that I absolutely hate, like like Breitbart or et cetera, um, just to see what people are commenting. And it's grueling. Like I only do it like once a month or something, check in on it. But oh. just seeing the, the levels of engagement on it, it could be bots, but it's also real people. Like their full names are there. You can look them up, et cetera. So it's like both, both things, like people utilizing, swinging people's votes anyways, and people not caring. Like Zuckerberg does not care. He's making his ad money. That's why, like, this is the main reason why I quit the social media world and like went into like the opposition in a way, but I know it's not going away. Yeah. So we have to figure out solutions. Um, the the fact that you said that you read um, or you follow people that of, of the opposition. Um, so in India, there's a there's a journalist named uh, Rana Ayub, and mm -hmm. he she talks about um, Muslim rights in India, especially with things that have been happening with the CAA. Um, mm which is citizen, citizenship amendment rights, essentially mm -hmm. to kind of get rid of us from our own country. Um, to put it very simply. Um, so ever since then, there's been a lot of riots. I mean, already a lot of riots existed, but I came across her through this and I follow her on Twitter. And if you go under her tweet, any tweet. I just followed her. Tweet, Twitter, yeah. Like yeah. If, if it's, if it's a political tweet, it's guaranteed that there's going to be a lot of people commenting, um, you know, against her. But if you, even if it's a tweet about Netflix, like I think recently she posted a tweet about um, recommending Netflix uh, series or something. And every single comment was uh, like, oh, who do you think you are? You're against Hindus. Uh, you know, several slurs, um, rape threats, um, you know, so like, <laughs> huh, huh, I'm, I do not want to be her. That, like, even just reading it on, uh, on the website or on, on my phone, I'm disgusted where I have to actually close, take a break, run around a little bit so that I can cool off. You know, I can't even imagine being in her position. Um, and like, that's the state of Indian journalism generally. Uh, if you're Muslim and you're political, uh, it gets difficult to live because there's so much cyberbullying, despite India being a democratic country. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know how you do it with the following once a month. Okay, I don't, once I can, a month, I just check in on it. It's not even it's direct. job now. <laughs> So I think that we should go to the next question, which is why do people often view the hijab as a sign of oppression towards women? This reaches back to the ignorance and what they see on the news. So they don't really know what the meaning and value of the hijab is. And rather than as seen as an oppression, it's more as like, or I see it as a pride of showing your religion. Um, hmm. But how would, how would you say so, Tahin? Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I have uh, I have an answer written down. Um, I think um, 
why people view it as a sign of oppression is because um, they think that this is what Islam has told us to do, like you have to cover up. Um, but actually the fact that I want to wear the hijab despite the whole, like the whole country or the whole society is telling me take off, take off, it's quite empowering. It's like, no, this is my body. If I choose to cover it up or not, it does not affect you whatsoever. And so um, it's, it's quite oppressive actually for them to tell me that, oh, you live in, in, you know, Western world now, you can take it off, you know, you don't live like in the Middle East or you don't live in, you know, in, in um, Southeast Asia where you know, it's expected of you to wear the hijab because, you know, of the men there or whatever, or the, the societal um, expectations and pressures or whatever it is. It, there's so many different reasons, but you know, you're, you're here now, you know, you're safe, you can take it off, but actually the fact that you're telling me to take it off you're, I feel oppressed you know I chose to wear it can't you respect that um and so um I have a little story I, I try not to be too long but um as soon as I um graduated from my undergrad five years ago um I started working for different architects and um, I met different architects in the field um and uh, I didn't work with them, not all of them, I worked with some of them and uh, I was fortunate enough to meet a Muslim woman in the field of architecture and um, I got really close with her and she's got like years more experience in the field and she straight up told me like I should take the hijab off or I won't become successful in the field of architecture and obviously um, speaking to someone with so much more experience i generally thought oh my goodness she's right i i have to do this and you know she kept telling me and i thought oh my gosh you know all these years of studying um architecture in uni um and now turns out i need to take off my hijab or i won't be come won't be able to become successful and so for months um i kept playing around with the idea of taking off my hijab and all that and whenever i'd see her um she would be like uh, you know, take it off, take it off. And I felt quite bullied and it's not nice because, you know, her being another Muslim woman um, in, in the field of architecture, it's rather than, you know, being like supporting me and be like, you know, empowering me for wearing the hijab, um, she did the complete opposite. And then it took for um, a, a woman that wasn't even Muslim um, who uh, was was an architect, and I I knew her because I worked in the same um, co-working space as her. And I spoke to her, and um, she she gave me a job, and she was like, you know, Tahin, you don't want to work with people that have that mindset. If they think that oh your um, your skills or your potential as uh, as an architect lies on how you choose to uh, practice your religion or how you choose to dress or what your beliefs are. You don't want to work with people like that. And this was so like, so lovely hearing this for someone that wasn't even Muslim. Um, and, and I worked for this lady for four years and she's incredible. Honestly, if I could still be working for her, I would be. Um, but yeah, she's, she was so lovely and we need more people like that. Um, and unfortunately, we do, actually, we do have a lot of people like that. We have a lot of allies, which is incredible. Um, even though that, you know, they're not Muslim or they're not from a diverse background, you have a lot of um, people showing their support and that's incredible. And so um, going back to uh, wearing the hijab and why people think it's um, oppressive is because, um, again, you know, what the media has been telling them, what they, um, what they what they see on the newspaper and stuff or whatever it is and um, there's all these different reasons um but again the media is feeding them um they think that oh you know islam is such a, a back backward thinking um religion you know the women are so oppressed they don't have any rights and stuff and so um these are some of the conversations i have with my um white colleagues at work and they are quite um, surprised by some of the answers Rim and I come up with or not come up with like the, the answers that we give them and um, even like stuff like um, about like financial um, you know financial aspects um, of a woman and um, and married and all that that's you know again it's, it's another huge conversation but the fact that 
you know, a, a woman's money is hers. And then, uh, and then all that, all that aspect, they were, uh, we, we told them and they, they were quite surprised. Like, you know, that's actually quite forward thinking for, um, for, for Islam, like for, from when, it, from when it originated for them to, uh, have these beliefs or these guidelines or teachings, it's quite forward because, you know, even in a Western society, it's, they don't, you know, you know, obviously people don't believe that, you know, uh, you know, it's 50, 50. And to be honest, I, I agree with that. But then, you know, in Islam, it's like, no, you the woman's money is hers and whatever the husband um, earns, that's for the family. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting to have these conversations. Um, and that actually Islam isn't uh, oppressing women is actually in our favor in so many ways. Um, and again, it's like all it goes back to having these conversations, opening up these conversations, being comfortable, um, not taking things personally. It's just people don't know and they, they will ask you questions. Then you know, we as Muslims should be doing research as well. So when people come to us with these questions, um, we can give them an answer, which is co correct. Not that something that we've been taught from our family or whatever, some you know, mixed up version of what we heard from friends or family and all that, but it's actually not what Islam actually says, if that makes sense. So yeah, that that was my answer. Yo, on mute. What about you, Fatima? Uh, for me, it's been interesting because it's been like ups and downs. Like I wear a hijab like this, and then I wear a turban style. I wear a sports hijab when I'm running. Like I just wear it in different ways and so I know I'm treated differently when I wear it differently because um, the turban is also a part of a lot of different cultures and so people may assume I'm not Muslim when I'm wearing it that way um, versus when I'm fully scarved with an abaya on everything then it's like oh yeah she's definitely Muslim then people treat me differently so it's almost become like an experiment to me to see <laughs> how people treat me differently but I come from in uh, Somali culture, you wear the long hijab, like it, it's past your knees, and that's where, that's what my mother has worn uh, since her, since she was like 18, and um, she even dabbled, I say dabbled, not to make fun of it, but she even uh, wore the niqab for a couple of years too, um, and it was interesting seeing me next to her when we're walking together, how she's treated versus me as well, and so um, I think with the hijab, it's always about choice, right? And so admitting to my friends, like I was staunch. I was like, everyone has a choice. Like we were all like forward thinking, progressive people, like just defending it. And then admitting to myself, like, no, like some people go through uh, upbringings or childhoods or households where they are expected to wear or made to wear, even if they don't want to. And then it plays out in media, right? Like, um, like popular YouTubers, like taking off the hijab, oh my God, it's such a dramatic thing. And most of the people commenting are Muslim men. And so that was also interesting because I was like, of course the men are gonna comment, but hearing things from friends where it's like, oh, like they only wore the hijab to make profit off of it. And now they got it, it's gone. Like there's so many different debates to it. Hinting at a British YouTuber right now just because she's on your side of the aisle and I felt really really bad for her because Who knows what she was going through and who knows what her journey is? Um, and her relationship with Allah like that's what we can't comment on is like how we're all approaching Islam but hearing it from non-Muslims. It's like you can't it's almost like I can make fun of my sister But as soon as you say something about her like it's on like it's almost like that where certain conversations are within the community certain conversations are within muslim women's experiences like even though we're all muslim men's comments like don't honestly make things better at times and so i think that's where i've been kind of figuring out even my own journey and being honest about it is so it makes me so hesitant like i feel like this is a safe space for me right now but i probably wouldn't have this conversation with certain aunties, for example, because it's like one way or the other. There's no gray area, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. How do you feel, Reem? 
Um, again, it comes back again to the idea of opening up these conversations. Like, um, wait, sorry, one second. What was the question again? Why do people often view the hijab as a sign of oppression towards women? Okay, there we go. Media, obviously. I mean, um, I remember from a very young age and you know when thing when the war was quite intensifying in Afghanistan and they would always show you like war scenes and then they'll show you Afghani women with the blue veil and like automatically you kind of group these things together I mean I've done it as a Muslim girl from a young age but that's because what I've been fed from the media um so obviously the certain media have certain agenda and they're quite tactical in the way that they do things um but also again like we were saying um, certain people are afraid of having conversations with women who wear hijab so they like to kind of just create assumptions from a far distance because that's comfortable for them but the uncomfortable bit is um, you know actually having those conversations and breaking the barriers and fully understanding like Leo Tahin was saying you know the fear of the unknown um, so that's one aspect but also I feel like um, uh Unfortunately, certain people in the media, in the industry, in certain industri industries, like French Mon Montana, for example, when he tried to kind of normalize the hijab by putting the, by getting, what was it? They were like these women with like big red heels and then he made them wear niqab and it was like, wait, hold on. That's not how you do it. You're doing it wrong. That's not the point. Um, so yeah, it's kind of certain people when they try to uh, normalize hijab or niqab or whatever, they think, oh, how's it, how's it going to appeal to the Western world? Mm, mm. Let's sexualize it maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going in, in their mind. But yeah, I don't think we need to be like, it's not about making it look appealing to anyone. It is what it is. And, you know, uh, religion isn't out there to change for anyone. It's just informing people. And I think, you know, a big part of Islam is, uh, you know, like we always say like da'wah, you know, like kind of, um, you know, doing your bit. So like maybe also like as a Muslim woman, I need to be more mindful. Like when I've got my hijab on, obviously my parents taught me to behave well in, in public, but also like I'm carrying my hijab, I'm carrying my religion. Like I feel like Muslim women have it more in them, like in public, they have a, a, a really a big responsibility to kind of portray to kind of like um you know carry well i don't know i don't know how to phrase this help me out guys i think you know what i mean but i mean if you see a woman with a hijab automatically you say she's a muslim so i'm going to start uh, if i'm a non-muslim i'm going to start creating a judgment on islam based on how this woman with a hijab is behaving in public and if she's shouting and screaming obviously i'm going to think what on earth but if yeah. I see her, like, for example, doing good uh, acts of kindness, for example, um, like, you know, it's within our religion, the sunnah, to, like, if you see a stick on the floor that can possibly cause harm for someone walking, you move it out of the way, right? So if um, a non-Muslim was to see me doing that with a hijab on my hand, they'll be like, oh, wow, like, that was a beautiful act for a Muslim to do. And just basically, as Muslim women with, who are veiled, it's just, uh, we're you know, we've been brought up to do these good things, but do them more, I guess, in public. Not for show, but I think just as a way to kind of ease the tensions, maybe. Again, it's a form of dawah as well, so why not? Oh, Reem. <laughs> I, I have something to say about I that. I have something to say about that. <laughs> so, but not in a negative way. I think in a more neutral well, I think what she what she said is so true and I think as you know doing these small acts of kindness is, is I feel like is a form of that word to, to non-Muslims but don't you think it's a bit unfair on us to be representing like uh, Fadila was saying uh, 1.7 billion people um, we're, we're having to represent like because we're so visibly Muslim that we have to do all of the representing for the for everyone. So it, it's it's exhausting though, you know, if we do one thing and it's like, oh yeah, that just, she did that because she's Muslim, you know. Um, but if someone was to be not as visibly Muslim and if they would do something bad or did whatever, they didn't smile at me, it's like, oh, it's okay, that like, she's just a regular girl, she's not she doesn't 
she just has a bit of an attitude but if you someone smiles at you and you didn't smile back at them or you spoke to them with a bit of an attitude you know oh that's because she's muslim you know you have to be extra nice you have to be extra of everything because you're visibly muslim and that is quite exhausting i have to admit sometimes because you yeah, know of course i find it exhausting myself because i, I want to have a bit of fun sometimes in public yeah. like i want to do exactly. certain things that aren't that yeah. might be frowned upon but i mean <laughs> i wouldn't do it because my parents raised me different obviously yeah. i mean that's number yeah. one and also to please Allah, like he wouldn't be happy with what I'm, the yeah. way I'm behaving. But also, there's that layer of the fact that I'm also a hijabi, and I need to be mindful of that as well. Like it's in my subconscious. Like that's not the first thing I think about, but I do think, oh, you know, like the fact that I've got hijab. Maybe like if I've done something good, like hopefully someone would notice that as well. Like yeah, it won't yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like even like small things, like oh, you your your hair's showing a little bit too much, and it's like, or oh, your skin's showing too much, and it's like. And then you're like, oh my goodness, I need to be like extra like put together because, you know, I'm a Muslim woman and I'm visibly Muslim. And um, even if it's not from non-Muslims, you would get that kind of criticism or like judgment from even Muslim, Muslim you know, within, you know, people within your community, within the Muslim community. It's like, sister, that's not, that's not right. You know, you're showing a bit too much ankle there, love. Um, cover that up. <laughs> um, so, you know, you've got so many Haram polices and, you know, you have to, I feel like you have to, be extra good or extra like you know put together and um yeah and if 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 it was um a muslim girl a muslim woman that isn't practice uh, practicing as much and she showed a bit too much ankle it'd be fine she doesn't wear the hijab it's okay you know um so i think that's within our community isn't yeah, it like yeah. there's also that misconception from other muslim people who see you that you're you've got a scarf on your head so they think Oh, she prays. She probably prays all her prayers, fasts all her fast, isn't struggling, reads the Quran every day, perfect Muslim. Yeah. But they see someone with a hijab, they think probably not on the deen as much as someone with a hijab, and that's completely irrelevant. Just because I've chosen to put that uh, a piece of cloth exactly. on my head, it doesn't mean anything. Exactly. I mean, and that relates a lot to me, right? Because exactly, um, I I do not wear a hijab because I do believe it is a choice, and my parents do not force me to wear it. Um, my relationship with God is my own. It's private. How I answer to God is, you know, like it's not supposed to be questionable to anybody else. Um, also, like I want to bring up that hijab is not just yeah. at scarf. Hijab is also how you portray yourself. Are you humble? Are you modest? Are your clothes not showing too much skin? Are they loose fitting? Are they not too tight? You're not showing your body. That's also everything because I do not wear tight clothes. I do not wear shorts or anything like that. And I do pray five times a day. And of course I wear hijab then. But just because I don't wear hijab, that does not, people should not question my religion in any other way because I've had questions when people hear that, oh, you're Muslim? Why don't you wear hijab then? You know, and it's often questions that I get like that. Sometimes you like, it's like they make you feel like you're not Muslim enough or something like that. Yeah. I, oh wow. So many points. <laughs> um, okay. I feel like, um, first of all, the normalizing of hijab equals to headscarf. And that you have to be, um, if you wear a headscarf, you have to be perfect. Those two things, normalizing those two things, um, that's within the community and outside the community, depending on how you, who you speak to and how you speak to them. Like in Arab centric places, even if you're not in, in a Muslim community, like if it's an Egyptian Christian, for example, they, they've grown up in places where hijabi girls are talked about that way if you're wearing too tight clothes or too um a little bit too much ankle whatever uh they're frowned upon so egyptian christians will think oh that hijabi isn't is inappropriate she she doesn't follow the deen okay so two things that's normalizing hijab equals a scarf and scarf equals perfect deen um another thing is like you said reem about the representation of um muslims so i have i have layers of problems with that and 
the thing is when I grew up and I started wearing my scarf, I started in the 10th grade and I, no, I started in the ninth grade and I wore it on and off because it was the first time that I was doing it in school and I would only wear it to school. I wouldn't wear it anywhere else and people would constantly question it. And then I would start questioning why I'm wearing the scarf. And I did it on my own. Like I wanted to, I wanted to wear it. Um, I wanted to see what, what it was about, learn more about it. Um, and then it was, it was kind of like the definitions that were, that were given to us were hijab equals scarf. And the, wear, the reason you wear scarf is because you want to be protected from the male gaze. And that is not true. Um, the reason we wear a scarf, the reason we're supposed to be under hijab, uh, which we'll define later, is because God asked us to. That's it. That's the first and foremost reason. The second reason is to represent that we are Muslim. So it's a form of resistance. In the, in, if we look at in the time of Prophet, Muslims were persecuted. Form of resistance, I'm wearing a scarf, I'm Muslim. Don't mess with me, I've got an army behind me. Kind of like that. It's still, res it's, it's still a form of resistance in, in this day and age. You know, when you walk out on the street, you wear your hijab, it's still a form of resistance. It is a form of resistance if you don't wear hijab as well. And I'll tell you why. Not, not really in like an Islamic sense, but in a women empowerment sense. Because at the end of the day, if you're not wearing it for God, who are you wearing it for, right? If your parents are forcing you to wear the hijab, then that hijab is meaningless, as in the scarf is meaningless. Um, but if your relationship with God and you're maintaining hijab, regardless of that, only God knows um, whether or not that's okay, where like nobody else is there uh, to judge you. Um, so in, in terms of meaning of hijab, I think, uh, Reem mentioned it last time. I don't know if it's exactly modesty or if it's boundary. What is the what is the actual literal translation, Reem? I think it was hijab, like hajaba, to kind of um, con conceal. Yeah, I mean, th there have been different definitions, and I've the most like the biggest definition come, that jumps out to me is. Uh, being modest in the way you think, in the way you act, in the way you speak, um, being humble, like like Husna mentioned. Um, but also that hijab isn't only for women, it's for men too. And um, lowering your gaze is like the biggest thing on, in like terms of hijab, like there's hadith that says, you know, when the prophet was riding on a camel, there was a guy and then there was a woman no hijab, beautiful hair. Guy saw the girl, wouldn't, wouldn't stop looking at the girl. It's like, oh, wow, nice. Um, and then he, the prophet asked him to lower his gaze, not, not the woman to cover up. Like, that was the first, first thing that was taught to the guy, not to the woman. Um, and so this is the point that I was going to make about, um, I mean, it's kind of like a compilation of everyone else's points. And it's that one of the reasons that um, hijab is seen as such an oppressive thing is also the policing within our communities, is how you police women constantly about how they wear the hijab, whether they wear the hijab, um, whether there's too much ankle showing, whether you're speaking to a guy, whether you're acting pr properly. Yes, fair enough, there are rules. There are things that we're supposed to do, supposed not supposed to do, but that is regardless of whether you wear a scarf on your head or not. You know, you talking to the opposite sex or you going to a bar. If you're Muhammad and you go and you drink, and if I'm a hijabi and I go and I drink, we're doing the same bloody sin, man. Like, <laughs> regardless of whether I'm visibly Muslim or not, we're doing the same bloody sin. So it doesn't amplify because I'm wearing a hijab whether I swear, whether I curse, all of these things, like this is not to normalize sinning, by the way, but just to, just to, for the Muslim people out there who are, you know, constantly commenting under modest hijabi, um, you know, influencers. And like uh, Faduma said that there are Muslim men. It's not just the Muslim men, it's the Muslim women, the kind of, the kind of comments they're putting under these um, these girls. Why do you follow them? 
if they take their hijab off, you don't agree with them, out. Don't engage with them. Don't buy their shit. Don't... Um, Number one is free mixing. And you're free mixing. <laughs> like you're, <laughs> like you're, you're breaking the first rule in the first place. Like, I don't get why, why suddenly, just because you wear a scarf on your head, you are this you know, topmost person on the deen. Like you know everything on the planet. And you know, uh, Allah is your favorite. Like um, uh, you're the, Allah's favorite for some reason. That doesn't exist. Where Literally, the reason we pray is because we constantly sin. We constantly sin. We don't, we, like, we're so caught up with worldly affairs and stuff that the reason we're asked to pray is, to, uh, is because we sin. And it goes across religions, man. Like, the policing of women and the way they dress, like, walking out, like, I'm sorry this is going to be a rant, but I had this conversation with my family members and someone was like, um, a woman was walking on the street her hijab so she was wearing it loosely so in india we generally wear it loosely like like pakistan as well like we don't wear it like a pin we wear it kind of loosely just around our neck like this but that's considered it's considered um hijab or appropriate in in, in india so the wind kind of pushed it back so it fell for like 0.2 seconds <laughs> and she guess I, I guess she didn't realize or she was doing something or whatever so it kind of stopped and in that span of 20 seconds the guys at the bus stop started catcalling um slurring uh, racial slur not sexist slurs um what kind of woman are you don't you have integrity like who what like why who gives all you of that right? because a piece of cloth from her head fell yeah, for a bit why to do that to a woman walking by minding her own business she's not doing anything it's the wind that freaking like i don't get it and on top of that it's there's this bunch of people that is agreeing with these guys she shouldn't have walked that way anyway why does she walk in front of them she should have lowered her gaze she should have just shut up and moved on she didn't have to engage with them because obviously she retaliated um but like yeah that i mean you know it starts always at, comes down to the woman it starts at home if you don't fix if people in the muslim community don't fix up support your muslim women um if you don't live and let live how do you expect other communities to live and let live like if you're constantly judging and you're publicly judging they're going to obviously think that it is an oppressive tool. You're not letting, it's not a choice. It's not something that you do. It's not your relationship with God. It's your relationship with the society. You wear hijab because of society. You're worried to take it off because of society. You, you know, sometimes you don't wear it because of society, because you feel judged. Because when I started school, that's how I felt. I felt like people would judge me if I started wearing the scarf in a Muslim country, by the way. So, there's layers to it it's just the constant policing of women's attire and goes across all communities and all religions and all cultures just stop <laughs> yeah i mean one thing you definitely said that was um just because you wear hijab it does not mean that you are like the highest role model of you know like you're very religious and things like that i mean if you are that's great but um i mean i know people who wear the hijab and it's not more so because of wearing it because of God, they're just wearing it because that's how they've been taught. You know, their parents forced them to. And even though they're wearing the hijab, they still go, they do, they date, they drink, stuff like that. But you're wearing the hijab, you know? I mean, it's the same. It's like, you know, you're still, you can still sin even if you're wearing the hijab. It doesn't mean yeah. that you're religious. It's like so. that jerk, you know, I'm going to drink alcohol, but I'm going to say bismillah before it, so it's okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> But it's, a, it's a joke, it's a joke. It's a joke, but, yeah. <laughs> I know, but I've never heard that one before. That's oh, yeah. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I feel like that's what Muhammad at the bar would be doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so we'll go on to the final question. Um, so how can we confront and get rid of Islamophobia? And I'll start with Fadumo. 
I mean, someone always has to be the other, right? Like someone always has to be the one that like gets the blame for everything. And so it, it, it just shifts. Um, I feel like post 2016, um, with two travel bands, AKA Muslim bands, um, the administration knew what they were doing with that. It was beautiful to see how many people came out. So when the first one came down, I was still in school. So I was still in New York. And the amount of people that just rushed to not only JFK, but the courthouse, just to, like, they didn't know the names of the plaintiffs yet. They didn't know who was stuck, but they just knew this happened because of the administration. And it was like two weeks into after the inauguration in 2017. I just couldn't stop crying because I honestly, like, I was like, yeah, of course my friends will come out because they know me. But like seeing people that never met a Muslim in their life, um, especially with a huge Jewish population there, um, there were people hugging and being like, regardless of how I feel about certain conflicts and views, et cetera, like this is wrong. And then people started talking about that, like other issues beyond the current ban. And so I feel like um, it, it's different in the midst of a pandemic, how to put yourself in front of others so that as we were saying, starting the conversation, um, now it's just more of a representation, I feel like is the main way of defeating it because uh, Ilhan just won again, thankfully, like in our district, but she had a really good challenger who said, Congrats. like, she's anti-Semitic. She's this, she's that. I took APAC money. I took this money. I'm a progressive Democrat and she's not. Um, and he's a black American, like he's a black dude. So it's like you, those that voted for him can't say like, like they have that shield. I'm not racist. Like I'm not Islamophobic. Like I voted for the black guy. Just like those people that say I voted for Obama twice. Like it's the same like deal. And so it's unearthing that. Like those that are straight up Islamophobic, they own it. They're on their side. They like mix among themselves. But those that say, I have a black friend, I have a Muslim friend, I have this friend, like it's harder to tell them, like, hey, you still have prejudices or you still have misconceptions, you still have presumptions especially and we can unpack that just like we have our own presumptions and etc and so I think the main thing is just it's one-on-one contact is how I'm viewing it like if you know someone personally it's harder to judge them just like uh Tahin and Reem were saying about their coworkers, like once they know someone and they feel comfortable asking the questions like then it's like oh okay like I have a source of information. Again, that's exhausting work. There are people that do the work, uh, like CARE and different organizations and our message and everything, but but people want to meet you in another way. Like, they're not going to come to an open house. They're not going to just put themselves, like, I, even though I feel like I'm progressive, I'm not just going to walk up to a church event and be like, hey, let me talk to y'all like it just so I put myself in someone else's shoes is how I approach every conversation it's like can I tell they did their research or they didn't and this is casual conversation um and I yeah I think it's more one-on-one thing versus like a big campaign again there were these like buses that would go around with like huge like billboards like learn about the prophet uh peace be upon him like and some people would approach, but it's usually people that, like, want to, like, debate or banter or whatever. But And then there are people who will just Google and constantly stay away, just do their own research. And so um, I know that was a long-winded answer, but I think it's, a, it's more of an individual approach versus um, having, like, a person that everyone looks up to, like Ilhan. She had to apologize for her comments because people were taking her comments and putting it on every other Muslim. And so it's an interesting perspective. And Rashida also being the first 
also one of the first Muslim women in Congress and also a Palestinian American. She doesn't care. Like, she's just like, I'm good with it, et cetera. But people also forget sometimes that she's Muslim because she doesn't wear the hijab. And so she's constantly reminding people of that fact. And so there's so many different approaches, but I think in all forms that we can get representation, um, as we were saying earlier, not all representation is good representation. And so um, just know that there, there are going to be different Muslim icons and like Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X and we just go with it. I'm not just saying this um, because I consider myself black, but with the discrimination that's gone towards the black community in America and all over the world for centuries, um, there have been so many good writings that could be applied to Muslim communities, but imams and sheikhs are kind of like, but they're not Muslim. So <laughs> I don't want to like approach this. And so there are some great imams um, that have like Imam Khalid Latif um, in New York, who uh, is still, I think, kind of heading the Islamic Center at the university. Um, Omar Suleiman, et cetera, that like, at least we can look towards them with putting, uh, I guess you could say, passing the microphone towards Muslim women and towards um, people of different backgrounds within the religion. That's I think one thing to be said about just um, learning in general is just be careful, like do your research, like do your research on people that you're researching. Don't just get any old article. Don't just get any old essay. You know, the scholars, the imams, the people. Like, I think I spoke to Reem about Noman Ali Khan and the issues with Noman Ali Khan. And um, hopefully everyone in the Muslim community knows the issues with Noman Ali Khan. But if you don't, please Google. Um, so, you know, as someone that grew up, like when I was in school, we constantly watched his videos. We constantly supported him. We constantly talked about how amazing this new imam is. And there are definitely people that are doing better work. There are definitely people who are well-read, proper. So do your research and do your background research on the people that you're actually learning from. That's important. If you don't know, ask your friends. Um, if you don't have Muslim friends, find out why you don't have Muslim friends and then go make some Muslim friends. We yeah. live in COVID situation. It's like online, man. You just go text someone. I don't know. Am you just I... have to be careful though. I feel like online. It's just really... Yeah, it's, true. It's, I mean, yeah. It's it's, yeah. It is getting more dangerous. Like anyone and can write anything anywhere and it's kind of like yeah. of course online is the easiest way of getting your information but like you said Zahra like talk to people because their experiences and their narratives number. their narratives are the ones that will they'll be more powerful than any sometimes they can be more powerful than any online resource you can come across yeah. I think um yeah do as much research as possible like it's even with me as a person, like the other day we were talk we were looking into whether or not a woman can travel without a mahram because we were so confused by the, by the answer because we travel alone. And for non-Muslims, mahram is a person that you, um, a man that you can't marry essentially to your brother, your husband, your, uh, not your husband, sorry, your brother, your uncle, your father, etc. Um, and well, no, there's like different schools of thoughts and there's several different rules and, um, there's conditions of time, there's conditions of distance. There's several things that we're just like, oh, whoa, we had no idea. Um, and there's so many different articles, so many different books that have completely opposing views. Mm -hmm. So it's, you, you gotta do your research. It's important. And don't even expect us to do research for you. But That's even as a Muslim, don't you think it's quite overwhelming to do your own research as well? Because there's so much that you learn from your family and so much you learn from the mosque and all that, but there's, there's still gaps. And then it, so when you start 
um, you know, questioning certain things and you start doing your own research, there's so much out there, so online books, whatever it is, and it's really overwhelming. And so um, I, think I can't imagine how it must be like for um, a non-Muslim, you know, trying to look into it to kind of understand what Islam is about or what our community is about. Do you know what I, I mean? I actually think it's a bit easier for a non-Muslim yeah. because you're coming from a completely different, like you're coming from a different background. So easier in the sense that there is no judgment for you researching. Whereas when you're Muslim and you come from a certain background and you're taught these things when you grow up, when you start questioning parts of your religion, mm. the things that you're taught, it becomes really difficult for you to start researching in the right places. Right. Um, especially with cultural traditions, when they themselves won't have the answers. And the only reason they don't have the answers is because they'll either blindly listen to an imam that's in the neighborhood um, that's making something up or maybe not making something up, just, you know, actually from Hadith. Based but, on some truth, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the yeah based on some truth, but, um, yeah. you know, the person that's telling you has no idea, so who do you believe? Yeah, right? yeah. The imam directly. Yeah. Um, so it gets, it sometimes gets overwhelming because you're questioning your entire existence, like your entire right. knowledge base on your, on your religion. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that kind of, um, made it a little okay for me while researching whatever I could was to constantly remind myself that it's okay if I don't know because it's not haram to not know. The fact that I'm trying to seek knowledge in itself is a, is a rewarding act. It's considered a good thing and knowledge in every aspect, not just the deen, like even knowledge in, in the field that you work in, the amount you travel, like, if you travel to go to school, each step that you take to travel is considered a reward if you're going to seek that knowledge. So, you know, even the little things, they, they, they add up. Mm. I mean, well, definitely, you just, just, I, I agree with you. There's nothing wrong with um, questioning certain things in your religion. I mean, often people push that like you shouldn't question but you're asking these questions because you care yeah. you know, and you should definitely go and do the research, you know, do as much research as you can to know exactly why you should do this, why you should do this. Um, and often, I mean, a good thing to do for me is like go and read like the English translation of the Quran because it will have a lot of the answers you're seeking. Or I watch like speeches from Dr. Zakir Nayak. So yeah, but it's, you're not going to have strong religion from the get-go. You kind of have to like, you know, believe, actually believe what, you know, what you were taught. And you have to have a reason for believing in it. So, yeah, but so Reem, what do you, like, how do you think we can confront and get rid of Islamophobia? We're never going to be able to get rid of Islamophobia, but obviously we could do our bit. And I think, um, again, conversation, you know, summarising everything that we've said, it, it includes uh, every single point that we've raised. But one of my experiences is from working at the Muslim World League here in, in London, their office. And I was involved a lot in their kind of... Um, dawa slash soft power approach um where they would basically um have a um during ramadan i remember it was uh we would go in and uh get like uh, a like a tray of dates and just oh yes put three dates in the pot and inside the pot put a message um put a kind of message like it's either a hadith or something from the Quran and just walk around with with these trays on the streets of London and just giving it out to people would you like a date give it to them and uh, just kind of have these and they'll say oh what's this for it's like it's Ramadan and and just kind of tell them about what Ramadan is and they're getting a date for, for, for you know they're having this kind of snack and then they're getting a message inside as well so I think yeah like this kind of soft power is really effective 
um and yeah i think and also they had a lot of you know you said that you go in and get a translation of the quran so they had a lot of uh, books like leaflets in english like uh, so we would go out as well with these kind of leaflets and kind of um on different topics like women in islam and empowerment and things like that and just give it out to them basically just to read as well with their dates um or they had um like a they used to have a, a road like a, a day where they would just give out red roses to to people on the streets so it's just kind of like little like gentle things like that and for Duma you mentioned the um you know the the iftar that you had the virtual iftar there was something similar to this here in the UK um so every year there there's uh, um, the open iftar Ramadan, on the Ramadan tent project and it's basically getting people together from different communities so obviously you know Ramadan's for Muslims and we fast and we break our fast at a certain time of the day but why not get uh, people from different communities and backgrounds who aren't Muslim to come and sit side by side with you and have these conversations and they'll bring someone to come and talk about something within the religion and it's kind of like they they, they are there having experiencing this with us uh, during such a holy month with in the year so they're actually being exposed to it um and i remember tahin um for a, a, um you know you got wendy and wendy got her friend they're both chinese from china and you know how things are in china they're very um what's the word communist you know like religion's not a thing like it's really they're very anti-religion anti-islam so they were like thank you for actually bringing us to this event because they saw how we how we deal like you know on uh, how we are within our religion you know the acts of religion fasting you know when we fought when you break your fast the adhan goes off so everyone went and prayed and came back so they witnessed all of this and they're like thank you so much we we never had this positive uh, outlook on religion and this has changed completely the way we view religion like we've always been taught from a young age that religion's a bad thing but now coming and seeing this it's completely changed out the way we we view it so you just have to do those subtle moves you're not, we're not forcing the religion onto anyone it's more like do you want to come like we've got this kind of event like do you want to check it out and people they'll they'll i mean people are open and this is london again you have to remember or wherever you are but diversity multicultural multiculturalism and people want to embrace different cultures you just have to reach out to the right people as well there are some people out there like no matter what you do like katie hopkins and tommy robinson like brick wall you're never going to get through it so there's no point trying it's more about trying with those who you can who are you can see they are willing to learn and accept others yeah and it's like when you brought up the point about china like it's it's funny how like anti-islam anti-religion they are even though they have like about 80 million muslims just in china so i mean yeah, Islam is like a global thing, but people often, they think it's just a racial thing. I've had, I've been mistaken, like, you know, my race as my religion. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, you're this? I thought you were Muslim. I was like, I am, but, <laughs> and it's like, kind of, you have to educate people that it's not, you know, it's not that. Um, so I feel like another good thing with like having open mosque days for people to come in and, you know, ask their questions and you can go with you know, go ahead and just give them an answer to their questions and things like that. Um, I have a question. Um, do the rest of you think Muslim is a race or no? No. No? no. You will think it's a race. It's considered a race. Yeah, like you can't be white and Muslim or like the converts, I think I mean, definitely Muslim, deal with this or Muslim. reverts. Yeah. 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 You're just, you're Muslim. That's your. I felt like a trick Muslim. question, Zahra. You even got me yeah. questioning if <laughs> Islam was a race. I had to think about it. Myself, like, I don't, I don't know. It, it like, is being Muslim a race? I mean, obviously Islam is a religion, hmm. but is being Muslim considered a race? Yeah. I think people, like people say, correlate being Arab and Muslim. Yeah yeah or, like that, yeah or people say uh, it's like, okay so for example um going out with a hijab and getting attacked verbally and you say 
why are you being racist? And then someone will come around, someone who's trying to be smart will say, well, actually, I'm not being racist because Islam isn't a race, so I can't be racist. And it's, mm-hmm. yeah. Technical. Xenophobia, but then they're like, what's xenophobia? Yeah. 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 I mean, it is still kind of being racist, even though it's a religion, um, because I don't it's know. It's xenophobia. Like, that's that's yeah. what it is. Yeah, yeah. And the issue is that um, terms like xenophobia, terms other than racism, discrimination, prejudice, things like this is why things like reverse racism exist because you can't be racist towards a white person, but you can be prejudiced towards a white person. That is possible. If there's a poor white person, you can be prejudiced towards them, but you can't be racist towards them. Racism is literally systemic oppression and the system is never against the white person. Um, I think my, I, I would like to add on to my answer and say, we need to educate people in high school, like school, from, from a young age, start talking about political terms, start talking about political movements, start talking about the correct histories. Um, obviously, not going to happen with governments that exist currently. But Yeah, I'm done with learning about King Henry and his 10, like, how many wives he had. Like, I don't care. Like, don't tell me the, the real Why stuff, you know? I don't like, know. What are you do with the eighth wife or the sixth like, wife? Like, I had to learn which year she was beheaded and why, and uh, it doesn't really matter. She's done. Even with architectural history, by the way, like, things like the exact date that uh, Notre Dame uh, was built or how long it took to construct. I mean, how long I get because you, you need to know certain um, technical values, but, like, still, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, educate, educate, so, research. Tahan, did you, you didn't get to answer yet, I believe, so. Um, but my answer was literally what every, um, what everyone said, um, it's just about opening up com- these conversations and, you know, having um, these conversations with non-Muslims. I think that's really important. And um, uh, yeah, even if it's uncomfortable, we should try have these conversations. And going back to what I said before, not everyone has the mental caliber to to have these conversations. So if you don't have that mental caliber, then maybe redirect them to someone that can, or or an organisation that is already doing these kind of things. Um, because um, yeah, if they they're coming and asking you these questions, they're interested in you know if you shut them out and be like, I'm not, I don't want to have these conversations. I can't. It it comes off negatively. So you can you know give little nuggets so you need to know a bit give them little nuggets and it's like oh maybe look into this look into that um yeah so that that's my answer and and literally everything what everyone else has said here um i i agree with them as well yeah definitely everybody had great perspectives um and once again i'd like to thank all of you for coming today i know that we did go well over time but this conversation i feel was important and it demonstrated a lot of things that people otherwise wouldn't have known. Um, I mean, I felt that it was a really good conversation. Hopefully you all enjoyed it too. Yeah. Um, it was really nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really thank you for organizing this. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for coming, thank you for participating. Yeah, I mean, I would just like to end it with, is there any future projects? I'll start with you three. Is there any future projects that MWA has planned in the future? or anything to look forward to? We have a future project called The Future of Safe Spaces. Hey. <laughs> and we have um, a project coming up, which uh, we're kind of like using our platform in the same way that you're doing. So it's, in, it's part of the Architecture Foundation, which is very white, whitely, white populated. Is that the right term to use? Like it's very driven by white people. So we thought, what a, fantastic opportunity would it be for us to gather all these Muslim people in the field of architecture and let them talk about their success stories and their journeys so um, we've got like really amazing uh, people on the uh, panel who are going to be discussing their journeys Um, next Thursday 20th August 7 to 8 p.m uh, British summertime wait let me put the link on here if you guys want to yeah, uh, but I would like to add, like the Architecture Foundation is very um, white populated, as Reem said. But I think the current series that they're doing, 
called 100 Day Studio. So they essentially have 100 days and every day they have uh, introduced a, a new architect or a couple of architects um, who do talks. And they've been very good with uh, increasing the amount of diverse uh, background, uh, BAME background, um, architects yeah. and design. They've been very um, good at that, yeah. They've been very good at that with this new series. And honestly, more people need to take take initiative, take it up. You know, the like London, the architecture profession is definitely changing. It just needs to start being hyped up a lot more. Yeah, definitely. We'll look forward to that. And what about you, Padumo? Do you, I mean, besides after Remote Iftar, do you have any other plans or projects or something to do with Remote Iftar that you'd like to tell us about? Um, right now, okay, so was going to do it right after Ramadan, but then the protests happened, so focused on that for a while. But because I got a listserv, I'd love to start connecting um, Muslims with either groups, resources, tech tools, especially because there have been so many awesome uh, things coming out, but there's no, like, I guess, resource to find out what everyone else is up to. And so mm -hmm. I think I'm going to start... I think I'm going to start, I posted it already, but this uh, newsletter subscription, it's completely free and everything, but it's just like maybe like a weekly highlight or a monthly highlight of what other Muslims are up to. So we definitely want to feature both of y'all just because I feel like once you capture emails, like that's like a valuable resource, especially because um, there were a few, maybe like 10 ish people that joined from the UK, but people in other countries as well joined. And I want to like keep it going in some way, like keep some sort of community going. Would love to attend y'all's um, event next week. But also I told this to Husna earlier, like if you guys ever need website help or graphics or anything like that, like let me know. And uh, Husna has my email and um, would love to stay connected. Thank you for organizing this, Husna and Carol. Yeah, thank, thank you all for coming. Yeah, no, this was... This is very important, especially personally, but just to deal with all the problem, social problems that are going on and you want to tackle them and show people that they shouldn't believe everything that's on the news. You know, just raise awareness and educate people. Yeah, so definitely thank you all for coming.